This session is called The Strange New World. And this is the challenge. On the one hand, I don't, wanna, I don't want any of you to underestimate the power, the danger of the evil that is active in this world. And then on the other hand, I don't want you to overestimate the power and the danger of the evil in this world. I want to navigate that line so that you understand the challenge we face as parents, that you understand the space that we're living in, that we're raising our families in. I know you see many things. You read the news and see the media just like I do. But I want to get down underneath what you see on the surface to describe the the forces that are at work, the forces that seek to take our children from us, quite literally, and disciple them. We need to start with a warning this morning so that we can make ourselves aware of the challenges that we face in parenting, uh, raising our children in today's world. Once we're all good and worried, then uh, we will settle our hearts, settle ourselves with the goodness and the power of God. Uh, the God who is sovereign over all things, uh, who is not surprised. In fact, he's planned the times and the seasons that we're in, and this is where he's placed us for our good and for his glory and for the furtherance of his plan that he decreed from before the foundation of the world. So we are not afraid, and yet we are uh, properly reverent before him and properly aware. And so that's what we want to do this morning, is kind of raise our awareness. I'm going to divide this, uh, what I have to say, into three points. And here's a first point that you can jot down if you're taking notes. It's called the rebellion of the world's agenda. The rebellion of the world's agenda. We learned last night that the, f- the formative role of the family And it rests on the foundation of marriage, which rests on the foundation of God's power, his goodness, his kindness. The family, though, is the first formative institution that God created to shape and to form individuals for his own glory. Marriage does that for men and women. Parenting does that for children. The family does that for all of its members. So far, so good. But the Bible tells us that the bliss of that first marriage, the joy of that first marriage came to an abrupt end when Adam sinned. When Adam sinned, followed his wife into eating of the forbidden fruit, and he and his wife did not believe God. The first sin came up from within the, <clears throat> excuse me, came up from within the heart, enticed by the devil's lies, And they turned away from believing in God and put their faith in the devil. Sin obviously has affected the family. It's not destroying the institution itself. The institution is still the institution that God created. And yet the institution is compromised in its effectiveness by the participants in the institution. Sin has had a corrupting and corrosive effect on husbands and wives, on parents and children, And the fruit of sin, not just within the family, outside the family as well, in all society, but the covetousness, the lust, the anger, those things result in infidelity, abuse, unfaithfulness, guilty sinners who sense their shame before God. They don't repent of their sin. They don't come to him and seek forgiveness. They're not reconciled to God. And instead, they try to cover over their sins with the fig leaves of lies and deceit, blame-shifting, and denying. The result of sin, broken covenants everywhere, broken promises everywhere, hopes of loving intimacy destroyed, corrupted, corroded, relationships fractured and torn apart by the pain and the hurt of self-centeredness, reconciliation rendered, humanly speaking, impossible due to lingering distrust, ongoing resentment, unforgiveness, bitterness that poisons the soul and then poisons whatever comes out of the mouth and ruins every other relationship. So this rending of relationships, the tearing apart of all relationships, not only turns individuals against one another, but it separates and divides entire generations. It turns the young against the old, 
and the old also against the young. That has been happening in our country and throughout the West for decades now. We are experiencing that Romans 1 downgrade, which you can turn to Romans 1 to, just to open this session. Turn to Romans 1 because it's a, we are experiencing a clear and obvious judgment of God that has come upon our land. Because of our idolatry as a country, in our prosperity that God blessed us with, we have actually loved the gifts rather than the giver. We have loved what comes from God's hand, but we really don't care what is in God's heart or mind. And so our country has committed a grave sin of idolatry. We love money. We trust in the God of progress. We trust in what we can create with our own hands. We think that the future will answer all of our problems. And so God has handed us over in that idolatry. And it started in Romans chapter 1. In verse 24 and following, God has handed us over to the sin of sexual immorality. And sexual immorality is a judgment. Many of our people, they don't see many of the people in our country for for many decades now, 50 years, 100 years, as they have given themselves to sexual immorality, they call it freedom. All the while, they become slaves of corruption. And their corruption in sexual immorality destroys relationships through lust and infidelity. It sows sows seeds of turmoil and distrust among people in the absence of the repentance that that handing over judgment was to produce in us. God then handed us over to yet another level of degradation described there in Romans 1 is homosexual immorality. The deviancy that is now covering our land with shame. And that widens the divide, not just from person to person, but now widens the divide between men and women. Men and women dividing from one another. Preferring to have a mirror image of themselves The self-centeredness is portrayed in their sexual lust for a mirror image of themselves. It's kind of an ironic judgment, but it's a handing over. Our, Our people in our country have interpreted that as freedom, as pleasure, as joy, and God says, this is your judgment. In the absence of repentance for that judgment that God handed us over to, God has handed us over to a final level of judgment there in Romans 1.28. Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy. When it says full of, think controlled by. They're controlled by envy and murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. God has handed our world, our country, over to mental debasement. And it's mental debasement that shows up in disobedient, disobedience to parents. <laughs> that obviously affects our responsibility to raise our children in the Lord's discipline and admonition. The world opposes our righteous responsibility as parents. They call good evil and evil good. Attitudes and behaviors that Christian parents are, are rejecting in this passage. Christian parents reject that and try to teach their kids away from that, but the world approves of that list of sins, not only approves of those sins and tolerates them, but actually celebrates those sins. So the way the institution of the family is designed by God to squeeze out pride and self-centeredness, to squeeze it out of its members, to form and shape and mold the individuals of the family through loving sacrifice of the self and giving to one another in love and serving one another in love, well, the world absolutely opposes that. The world 
is overtly hostile to God's design for the family, inciting pride, encouraging self-centeredness, teaching it. In fact, the progressives of our country, the liberals, have succeeded in turning the tables on God's goodness, calling his good evil. They have recast Christian marriage and the Christian family as inherently and irretrievably oppressive as that which suppresses individual creativity, individual self-expression. Today's progressives are the product of enlightenment, liberal ideology, and a centuries-long project to unshackle the individual from any social responsibility or any institution that would shape and form, take away every restraint. Every institution today must now bow before the sovereign self. The shift in our culture has not happened suddenly. It has not happened overnight. It hasn't happened in a few years, even though the rapidity of change in our, in our society over the last 10 years has been absolutely bewildering. But it's actually been, this change has been happening for a long, long time, very gradually over centuries, in fact, in such, a, such a, a, a gradual change that hardly any of us noticed for many, many decades. In his book, which some of you have may, read, uh, may have read, the, the Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self by Dr. Carl Truman, he traces this, what he calls the triumph of the modern self. The triumph of the modern self. It's a triumph over what? A triumph over our Judeo-Christian heritage. A triumph of the modern self, self self-centeredness, over God and his love, over others-centeredness, over the good of people, over the, the love of God and the love of others. There is a triumph of the self over Christianity, over the institution of the family. Throughout most of human history, the individual served within the institution that they, the, every individual understood the institution was to be served. It's something that they gave themselves to, something they found their identity in, not the other way around. But Carl Truman says individual concern at that time was outwardly directed. Individual concern, the individual growing up in society, he was focused on communal beliefs, practices, and institutions that were bigger than the individual, in which the individual found meaning, end quote. In in Christian families, that's still the case. Individuals find meaning through the family. Individuals give up of their own autonomy, any sense of autonomy, self-rule, in order to serve the greater interests of the family. That's still the case in our Christian homes. But beginning, as Carl Truman says, beginning in the 18th century with Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he regarded the community, or institutions, as a hindrance to the full expression of the authentic individual, a point picked up and given artistic expression by the Romantics. According to men like Nietzsche, Freud, and Marcuse, and only the self matters, Only the self matters. Dr. Truman explains the way things are now. Here's what he says. In the world of psychological man, it's the time we're living in right now, that the psychological self is most preeminent, highest sovereignty in our society. So in the world of psychological man, the commitment is first and foremost to the self and is inwardly directed. So the order is reversed. Outward institutions become, in effect, the servants of the individual and her sense of inner well-being. He goes on to say, I might press this point further. Institutions cease to be places for the formation of individuals via their schooling in the various practices and disciplines that allow them to take their place in society. Instead, these institutions become platforms for performance. It's where individuals are allowed to be their authentic selves, precisely because they are, given, they are able to give expression to who they are on the inside. For such selves in a world, in such a world, institutions such as schools and churches, as well as the family, 
These places are places where one goes to perform, not to be formed. Or perhaps better, where one goes to be formed by performing, end quote. You've seen this in the collegiate swimmer, Leah Thomas, who is formerly Will Thomas, I believe his name is. A biological man competing with women in women's swimming and crushing it, getting first place in all the events because he is competing against women. With his biological structure, his, his greater bone density and bone structure and mus- muscularity, he's able to outperform women in his races in the pool. And he calls himself a woman. He's using the platform provided by collegiate sports to express himself. His expression of himself, who he believes he is on the inside, becomes more important than the platform or the, or the institution itself. The institution is there to serve him, not the other way around. That's what Carl Truman is saying. Dr. Truman traces the path of Western thought from Rousseau to the Romantic poets to social and political philosophers like Nietzsche, Mark, Marx, Darwin, and also all the way to Freud. And then, finally, to the postmodernists like William Reich and Herbert Marcuse. Centuries of rebellion. This rebellion, this philosophical rebellion, overtly working to overthrow Christianity, has now become the status quo, the normality in primary and secondary schools, also colleges, universities, and then all those people graduate and go into all of our other institutions throughout society, particularly the media. These men that Truman cited represent the philosophies that have come to us and shaped the culture of the West, a secular culture that has now, in effect, has displaced Christianity. Hostility to Christianity is the logical consequence of this Enlightenment ideology thinking, which prizes individual liberty above all else, which means Christianity, which calls for self-denial, is threat number one. So to the Enlightenment mind, Christianity, the, the institution of the family, it's not merely outdated and irrelevant, but it's actually harmful. By calling people to deny the self, by calling people to take up the cross and follow Jesus Christ, to obey him, to submit their wills and themselves to God, to his word, to Christ, instructing people to exercise self-control, telling people they have to restrain the flesh, not give in to the flesh, mortify the flesh. Well, the family becomes an institution now of oppression, of psychological harm, which they see as bringing about all kinds of other social maladies. Because if you suppress the self, they say, you're gonna drive people to drug abuse. You're gonna drive people to self-harm, girls to cutting, boys to sexual abuse. You're gonna drive these people, these transgender people, if they aren't allowed to be, if, if a man is not allowed to be the woman that he is inside, or a woman vice versa, allowed to be the man that she feels she is on the inside, you're gonna drive that person to suicide. And you've got blood on your hands. That's what they're saying to us. Liberation from traditional morality taught by religion and the Christian church in particular. All this that's passed down through the ages by the enculturating, formative, shaping power of the family. Well, people today are viewing the idea of the family as a social cancer. Something that needs to be subdued, irradiated, and then cut out and cast away. Instead, The view now is that the state should take the place of the church and the family to champion enlightenment ideals, to promote the self. And the chief tactic in the strategy is to sexualize and to politicize absolutely everything. This was William Reich's view that the state should exclude parents from educating their children. He said this, the sexual education of the child is simply of too much social and political consequence as to be left to the parents. After all, it is the parents, as those who are in authority, who actually constitute the problem. The family, as traditionally understood, needs to be dismantled." End quote. 
William Reich is saying parents equal problem. That's his view. Truman points out, he says, quote, it's stating the obvious to note that what Reich was arguing on this score in the 1930s is now increasing the increasingly dominant view of our own contemporary society where questions of childhood and adolescent sexuality and gender, gender identity raise immediate and significant questions about the respective rights and responsibilities of parents and of the state, end quote. To make this clear, questions about two men raising a child or two women raising a child or multiple people raising children or transgendered people having babies or biological boy changing in locker rooms of biological girls, these are the so-called questions of sexuality and gender identity that schools are now saying are no longer the purview of parents. This is the purview of the state. This is for the courts to decide. This is for legislation to decide. That's where we find ourselves today, in a world of radical deconstruction, a culture that is intent on destroying the very foundations of culture. The radical redefinition of marriage and family tears apart the fabric, not only of society, but of humanity itself. And because marriage retains its power as a formative institution, it shapes and forms the culture of tomorrow by what it passes on today. Listen, parents, you need to understand that the world wants to disciple your children. Grandparents, the world wants to disciple your grandchildren. They want to teach them to not only practice cel uh, sexual immorality, they want to teach them to celebrate it, to rejoice in it, to rejoice in further forms of perversion. So they take these children in deeper and deeper into depravity, degrade their minds, defile their consciences with guilt, and these kids become so saturated with shame, they become hardened and insensitive to conviction. Their consciences are dulled, silenced. To disciple your children, the world will use all of its resources, all of its power, all of its institutions to strengthen your child in its rebellion against God rebellion against you. With no institutions of its own now, because the world has rejected them and tried to destroy them, the world now takes institutions that God has created that are durable, the family, the state, the church, and uses God's good gifts to promote its sinful agenda and carry on its own long war against God. The world has reshaped the institution of the family twisted it, distorted it, reimagined marriage and family, and now is trying to pass off that false form of marriage and family to upcoming generations of its own. By the inherent forming, shaping power of the family then, the world hopes to reform and reshape the entire culture by reshaping the generation of tomorrow and doing that over and over. So today, marriage and family has become a performative institution. It's a platform for self-expression. Same thing has happened, by the way, to other social, social institutions in our world, as you can see, government and state, institutions funded and controlled by the state, so schools, colleges, universities, medical institutions, financial institutions, you could add to that list as well, even churches. There are compromising and apostate churches that have become completely complicit in furthering the world's agenda. The way this shows up today, the institutions of the home, education, government, even the church, they have become stages for expressive individuals to show their world their authentic inner selves. Yuval Levine, who I quoted last night, he writes this, he says, quote, we have moved, roughly, roughly speaking, from thinking of institutions as molds that shape people's character and habits towards seeing them as platforms, stages, that allow people to be themselves and display themselves before a wider world. I'll just add to that that the platform or the stage, that is what now is setting the mold. That is what is setting the expectation for our young people. It's, it's setting an aspiration before them that they all must be expressive individuals. 
This is where we see the intrusion of the agenda in schools and public libraries and churches as well. This performative nature of the LGBTQ rebellion, transgender, the drag queen story hour, all that filth is now having a formative impact on the generations coming up. Many of the generations coming up do not understand why it's wrong. They see it as something to be celebrated. Truman says, it is the very essence of the culture of which we are all a part. To put it bluntly, we are all expressive individuals now, end quote. That's the agenda of the world. That's its rebellion, the ideas that come out of enlightenment ideology. Here's a second point for this morning. Number two, the power of the world's influence. The power of the world's influence. The world's agenda has been advanced over the past few centuries, moving forward with an greater, ever-increasing strength and its influence through forces that Dr. David Wells identified back in the 1990s. He called these the forces of modernity. I don't know if you've heard that term before. Modernity is a term that David Wells uses to describe the values and the meanings of the world we live in today. Modernity. Modernization refers to the process by which all of us are assimilated into the modern worldview, into modernity, into a secularized way of thinking. It's not that we all become secularists, it's that even people who practice religion have a secular pattern of thinking, which is what I'll go on to describe using some of David Wells' uh, material from his books. David Wells introduces the process of modernization. Um, He says it's driven by four main realities. This modernization is a force, forces that move through our culture, that, that shape the way we think about things, make us more secularized in our thinking, not, not taking away our religion, but actually marginalizing our religion so it becomes more and more private and not really practiced in public. That's the force of modernity to say, yeah, yeah, you can be a Christian, just practice that in your own church. Practice that in the privacy of your own home. Just do your devotions and be happy with that, but don't bring that out here into the schools, into the public square. That's what modernity is doing. And now, not content to leave it private, now it's entering into the private sphere and trying to control what goes on there too. Four main realities of the process of modernization, modernity, capitalism, technology, urbanization, and telecommunications. Those are four realities of modernization that I'll describe briefly. Quoting from his book, God in the Wasteland, give you a brief description of each of these. Capitalism, he says, emerged as a defining force in Europe in the beginning of the 19th century when industrialization got underway. But it did not reach its full intensity until technology became both ubiquitous in society and indispensable. Capitalism has reorganized the social structure for the purposes of manufacturing and production and consumption. It's concentrated populations into cities and produced massive systems of finance, banking, law, communications, and transportation. In short, capitalism has changed the shape of our world, how we relate to it, where we live, how we experience our work, and the values and expectations that we bring with us in order to be adaptable to and successful in the public square, end quote. Now for you and your children, your families, your parents before you, we have seen capitalism as a good thing. It's a benefit that has been derived from the modern world. It's a, it's a gift. I mean, what is the alternative anyway? Is it socialism? Is that better? Is uh, fascism, communism? No, we would say capitalism is a good. We say we actually justify capitalism and property ownership all as a good thing. It's biblically justified. It's a system that is a good system that works. Capitalism is a good, but it is not in this modern world an unmitigated good. Like all gifts of modernity, as it gives, it also takes something too. 
For all the benefits it offers, what capitalism requires in trade is the reshaping of our entire value system. All of our judgments are shaped by the marketplace. So now we hardly, without, without hardly giving it a thought, we value that which works, that which makes money, that which grows big, the things that draw big crowds. We think if it's big, if there are a lot of numbers, if there's a lot of money flowing, a lot of revenue, if there are a lot of people drawn to it, that is big, that's successful, that's what God is in. That's how we think now. And we don't stop to think how totally unbiblical that mentality is. We don't stop to think how big often does not equal best, biblically speaking. Biblically, often what's big and popular is usually deceptive, ridden with errors, lies, deceit, it's false, it's rebellious. Think about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. What do they want to do to Moses after a while? Stone him and go back to Egypt. That was the majority. That was their vote. Kill him, let's go back. We prefer slavery to following the Lord and his law. Skip all the way to the end of the Bible, and we see the entire world under the dominant forces of the beast and his religion. And so, the entire world is going to be on the side of what is bad. Everything that's successful, everything that's driving the economies of the world, all the money, all the systems, all of its religions, all of it big, successful, prosperous, thriving, God is not in that. And that's what the false prophet is going to tell the world. God's in this. We've become rather uncritical about our faculties of our assessment, judging all things as we do as Americans, especially by pragmatic and utilitarian assumptions. We're all consumers now. The influence of capitalism and all the goods it provides, and yet we've failed to see how it's shaped our values and our judgments so significantly. Continuing with Dr. Wells' introduction to modernity, here's what he says about technology. Quote, technology is, of course, essential to modern capitalism. Its importance lies not simply in the fact that it facilitates the production of knowledge, makes possible medical and engineering breakthroughs, but also in the fact that it also rationalizes all of life. People who live in technologically dominated societies are prone to think naturalistically and to subject all of life to a calculus of benefits to assume that whatever is most efficient is most ethical, end quote. Technology, the development of technology, orients our thinking always to progress, to look to the future, to solve all the problems of the present, to overcome all the evils of the past. Causes us to tend naturally toward the use, the embrace, the preference of what is new, and to throw out, to jettison what is old. How does a preference for the new affect our acceptance of an old Bible, an ancient religion? How does a bias toward the new give us all a progressive bent? How does it turn our hearts manward to make us man-centered in our thinking instead of Godward and God-centered in our thinking? How do we learn to trust along with the rest of the world around us in the God of progress that medical technology some process, some procedure, that'll save us from cancer. That'll save us from heartbreak. We'll look to the scientists. Look to God, the, the God of progress, which is the chief idol of our time, rather than looking back to the ancient God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Technology inculcates us with a host of worldly instincts, worldly assumptions, rationalist naturalist, pragmatist presuppositions. In a very practical sense, technology development moves us toward urban centers, toward cities. Wells goes on to describe this urbanization as another force of modernity next. He says this, quote, modernization has been driven by the stunning growth of urbanization, which is now spread beyond the West to become a worldwide phenomenon. Cities create their own 
psychological environments because they draw into their precincts and into close contact with one another people with very different worldviews. The new multicultural environment has produced a secular ecumenism and a powerful demand for pluralism, for mutual tolerance, for private space in which to hold one's beliefs, to live one's own lifestyle, to do what one wants to do, end quote. All these different religions and worldviews, as they are shoved together in urban centers and cities, as your kids play soccer with the Muslim kids and the Hindu kids and the Baha'i kids and the secular atheist kids, it all encourages us toward a superficial unity so we can all get along. Wells calls it a secular ecumenism. By promoting values in our country as we have for decades, values of diversity and tolerance and pluralism, all these are able to find the lowest common denominator, find ways to get along and come together in a spirit of relativism and subjectivism so that we can coexist. And then we blend, and then we syncretize. In other words, there is no place left in our public square for absolute truth. No place left for objective truth in the urbanized setting. And that makes Christianity the unfriendly outlier, the fly in the ointment, always the problem. Because Christianity claims absolute truth, the exclusivity of God and salvation in Jesus Christ. You can't come to God any way old way you want to. There's only one name in heaven, under heaven, by which men must be saved, and it's the name of Jesus Christ. So we're the problem. We're standing in the way of progress. We stand in radical contrast to all the religions of the world. Every world religion is grounded in man's accomplishment. Only biblical Christianity is grounded in divine accomplishment with no addition from mankind. Demonstrated in the historical reality of Christ's crucifixion, his resurrection, all that God has done. Imagine though, think about this, the pressure on today's children who are raised in Christian homes but they are schooled in the secularizing forces of modernity. The power that is there to erode all differences and join all these disparate groups into a coexistence. Our Christian kids are pressured and they're shamed to stay silent, to keep their Christianity private, quiet, keep it to themselves. That's happening in the schools. It's also happening in the neighborhoods. And sadly, folks, it's also happening in our churches. Capitalism, technology, urbanization, and finally, telecommunications. Here's David Wells again. He says this, quote, modern telecommunications has made us all citizens of the whole world. We've become witnesses of an extraordinary range of events that take daily shape and shake the world. Television and now the internet gives to us a psychological transcendence of space, both physical and cultural, linking us to people, other people around the world. The bonds that television and the internet create, unlike those that once prevailed in the small towns of America, the bonds are entirely synthetic, even if it doesn't seem that way. The communion that television and the internet provide, the communion of common voyeurs, can seem as real as that of a local neighborhood. Consider how much attention we give to hurricanes, conflicts, wars, riots, all of them far, far beyond our local communities. Television and the internet produce mass communal reactions to material that is bound to any specific context, to fads and fashions, disconnected sound bites of mass culture. It spins out information in such abundance as to rob most of that information of any value." End quote. To the nearly instantaneous power to transcend spatial boundaries, as Wells says, it affects the way we relate to people. Many people, especially young people, are more comfortable with people who are remote and far away from them than they are those people who are at a safe distance, safe is a big term these days, than those who are near, those who are in close proximity. Pastors know this represents all kinds of challenges in shepherding people, in knowing them, perhaps correcting them, confronting them, calling them to repent. 
Parents, too, they can struggle to talk with their distracted teenagers who are glued to iPhones. Minds are subdued, carried away by an instantaneous stream of information, most of it irrelevant, most of it very far from them and having nothing to do with their daily life, really, but all of it powerfully evocative, powerfully shaping. What Dr. Wells has introduced us to in the shaping power of modernity through the forces of capitalism, technology, urbanization, telecommunications, whether or not you are aware of it, modernity is affecting you. Whether or not you're aware of it, modernity is affecting your children, all your friends and your church members, their families as well, affecting all of them. And I'll give you just one example. Think about this. We could trace this in a number of different ways, use a number of different examples, but just think about the daily struggles of the pre-modern world. You're living out in a rural area. Everything that you eat comes from what you have done with your hands. You, every day is, every season is a fight for survival for your family. You're scraping together essentials, food, water, clothing, shelter. That's a continual concern of the pre-modern world, pre-industrialization, pre-advancement in technology, pre-discovery. That's how the world has lived for most of its time. And that is why in the pre-modern world, the religious heart of man came out very clearly in many sinful forms called idolatry, bowing down to statues, praying to Baal, calling for rain. You know what? Christians did? They prayed, give us this day our daily bread. And they really meant it. I need bread today to feed my family. And God, I look to you to provide it. Who worries about those things anymore, at least in this country? Even many Christians have stopped praying, give us this day our daily bread. They don't do that before, our ch before their children either. Because, is it because they don't trust God? Well, certainly do, they do trust God. Christian families trust God. It's just that when they're out of bread, they get into their car, technology, and they drive to the store, transcending the space that used to keep them from the store, and they go and buy some bread. They don't even think to pray, give us this day our daily bread. That is secularization. That is how God becomes remote to them and not intimate, needed every single day. Modernity is like that. It doesn't overtly attack Christianity as the proponents of the Enlightenment ideals, some of those men that I quoted, not, not, not like they've done. The shaping power of modernity, it's invisible to us because it's kind of in the, it's, it's in the godless air we breathe around us. It's in the secular assumptions that we tend to make without even noticing. David Wells says this. He says it is one of the defining marks of our time that God is now weightless. I do not mean by this that he is ethereal, but rather that he has become unimportant. He rests upon the world so inconsequentially as not to be noticeable. He has lost his saliency for human life. Those who assure the pollsters of their belief in God's existence may nonetheless consider him less interesting than television, his commands less authoritative than their appetites for affluence and influence, his judgment no more awe-inspiring than the evening news, and his truth less compelling than the advertiser's sweet fog of flattery and lies. That is weightlessness. It is a condition we have assigned him after having nudged him out to the periphery of our secularized life, end quote. Again, it's not that modernity has secularized us overtly, making a frontal attack that we could notice. Modernity's influence has been far more subtle. It's captured the souls of the young and by making God seem irrelevant to their daily lives pushing him out to the margins. The modern practice of the Christian faith has become increasingly private, increasingly inward, more individualistic and devotional rather than absolutely essential. That's what we need to teach our children, that God is essential to us. 
that he matters every single day. His words are the very food that our life depends on. For children growing up in our homes, under our roofs, eating our food, going to school, playing games, the power of modernity is more influential than the weekly services of the church. And as the process of modernization continues, most people are blithely unaware of it. For those who start to wake up, we awaken to the fact that we're living in what we can only describe as something of a pleasant dystopian nightmare. We're living in the world that's predicted way back in 1932 in the 1932 novel by Aldous Huxley called A Brave New World. Perhaps you've read it. Two versions of a dystopian nightmare that could face our future, both written in approximately the same time, George Orwell's 1984, which talked about a, a totalitarianism of, of a big brother in the state basically governing every aspect of lives. It was, you know, the, it was the image of the, of the boot smashing the head. That's the image of 1984, George Orwell. Aldous Huxley painted a different view of the future, and it really is kind of the one we're living in. He describes a futuristic society called the world state, where the destruction of the family has become complete. The process of socialization has been perfected for common benefit. The world state is a society based on science, based on progress, based on efficiency, based on utilitarianism and pleasure, and no one needs God anymore. There are no families. In fact, the very idea of mothers and motherhoods and motherhood and fathers coming together to create children, that is, that is, that is called a mark of savagery. That's like from the prehistoric past. It's backward thinking. It's crazy. Who would ever do such a crude thing as procreate? Instead, the family is the world state. Children are incubate, incubated in labs. One of its mottos expresses this, everyone belongs to everyone else. The dictum is a euphemism for sexuality, which is not necessary anymore for producing children because that's all done in a lab. That sex, sexual activity is only for the act of engaging, a serial polyamory that though pleasurable is emotionally detached and empty and meaningless and boring, quite frankly. No one is jealous, no one is envious because everyone stays distracted, moving from one entertaining diversion to another. Any dull moments, if there could be any, are medicated with a recreational drug called Soma, which not only makes people feel good, but also numbs any sense of guilt and subdues any impulse of moral reasoning or questioning. If Huxley hadn't written that novel back in 1932, we'd probably file the book in the historical fiction section of the library because he is describing a world strikingly similar to the one we're now living in. So many haunting parallels. The destruction of the family through promiscuity, adultery, divorce, continuous attempts to offer new and better versions of the family, decoupling sex from procreation, People avoiding the natural God-intended consequences of sex like pregnancy and childbirth, which is his good, his blessing. Now it's called an evil. Now it's called something we need to avoid. There's now a promiscuous attitude toward coupling and uncoupling as sex has become nothing more than a meaningless act of self-gratification, completely disconnected to future generations. People are trying to have children through all means, in vitro fertilization, test tubes, incubators, and if they have their wish, through cloning. The conveyor belt production of human beings. The numbing of the mind, the will, the emotions, the, the sense of moral right and wrong, sense of outrage, that's happening through, numbing all that is happening through legal pharmaceuticals, as well as the legalization of formerly illegal and very powerful drugs many of which are killing our nation right now. Increasingly, our world is looking like the one that Huxley described in A Brave New World. And he didn't, he didn't write it as, a, as something to aspire to. He was actually writing a warning for seeing the effect of modernity on society. That was back in 1932. This is our challenge, parents. This is our challenge, grandparents, 
to raise our children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord now, in this time. And no matter when, what history or what time in history Christians live, it is always a challenge to live for the godly, isn't it? But this challenge is our challenge. This day is our day. So we've talked about the rebellion of the world's agenda, the power of the world's influence. These may seem to be insurmountable as we engage in parenting, are they? No. <laughs> Number three, let's talk about the certainty of the world's end. Third, the certainty of the world's end. Turn to 1 John 2.15 and read along with me. I've got to get there quickly because... I'm running out of time. John says this, 1 John 2.15, do not love the world, neither the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, for all that is in the world, the lust of the, the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The brave new world of Huxley, the strange new world of this enlightenment progressivism, the rise and triumph of the modern self, all of this is passing away along with all of its desires, all of its lusts, all of its ambitions, all of its aspirations. The forces of the modern world, capitalism, technology, urbanization, telecommunications, also passing away along with the desires that they arouse, along with all the lusts that they incite. If it's only the one who does the will of God who abides forever, that, by the way, is another way of describing Christians, us, true worshipers of God. They're described as those who do the will of God. If you do not do the will of God, don't call yourself a Christian. It's those who do the will of God who are the Christians, those who search his word to find his commands that they might obey them because they love him, because they've been saved by him, because they've been forgiven by his grace, because the penal substitutionary atonement of the cross was offered for them, that their sins might be taken away and forgiven, that they might be covered in the righteousness of Christ. Those people who have a new nature given to them by God, who see that atonement, who put their faith in Jesus Christ, who trust in him, those people and those alone belong to him. They are the ones who do the will of God, and they are the ones who abide forever. That's where our focus needs to be. That's where our hearts need to be. That's where we must direct the hearts of our children, is to do the will of God and abide forever. Let this world go. Let this world go. Isaiah, likewise, you can turn there, Isaiah chapter 40. He encourages his people in Isaiah 40, 6 to 8, and this is where our hearts need to be, the hearts of our children. This is how we need to instruct them. A voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, all its beauty like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. A few verses later, Isaiah says this, verses 12 to 17, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands? Who has marked off the heavens with a span? Who has closed, enclosed the dust of the earth in a, in a measure and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? Who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, taught him knowledge, showed him the way of understanding? In other words, does the modern world impress God? The progress of the world, new version of the iPhone, is he just kind of wringing his hands, waiting for that when that time's gonna come? Is he waiting in bated breath for all the new features of all the new technology? No. Does the rise and the fall of grass intimidate God at all? Consider the weight of the glory of God and then on the other side of the balance, put everything else. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and they are accounted as the dust in the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. All the nations are as nothing to him and before him, and they're accounted as less than nothing and emptiness. A few, few verses after that, verses 21 to 24, Isaiah says, Do you not know? 
Did you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings princes to nothing, makes rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. Parents, we need to know the battle space We need to know the threats in the world we live in, the aggressiveness of the world's interest in discipling our children. But we don't need to be overly anxious about the world, or worse, try to fix the world. There's no fixing this. We have a sovereign God who reigns over all, who has never lost control of the world. He's kept the planets aligned and the stars in their places and all the galaxies in their orbits He's kept all the molecules in my body and yours together. It is his will that's being accomplished in this world. It's his purposes decreed from before the foundation of the world. His plans are being executed right now perfectly without any hindrance whatsoever. He's not concerned about the developments of Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or any of the other tech billionaires. He's not really worried about them. Our job is to keep our eyes fixed on this God in childlike faith, dependent trust, and to be out about the business that he has given us to do. So if we're parents, we need to parent according to God's design. We have a great commission mandate from our Lord, which brings us to a final point for this session. Very short. Starts with this. We consider ourselves. Number four, the priority of the Christian's home. The priority of the Christian's home. If you're married... The priority in this ungodly time, a time dominated by enlightenment ideology, empowered by the assumptions and the forces of modernity, your priority still is on the worship of your God first, and then on your marriage second. Focus on your marriage. If you're married and you have children, your priority in this ungodly time is on your worship of God first, and then second on your marriage, and then third on your children It's going to be hard to convince your children that God means more to you than anything, that God is weightier than all the world put together, that his word is heavy, that it is glorious to you. If you can't get your children to put down their phones, if you can't get them to turn off their screens or stop playing video games, or worse, if your children can't get you, the parent, to put down your phone and turn off your screen. You'll never worship and glorify a God you don't know or know only superficially or worship half-heartedly. You'll never enjoy a God you don't know deeply. A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Think about that. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. If we're to inculcate our children in a sense of God's majesty, convey to them the true weight of his glory, the awesomeness of his holiness, if we're to teach them the fear of the Lord, it starts with us. Tozer says, with our loss of the sense of the majesty has come the further loss of religious awe and consciousness of the divine presence. We've lost our spirit of worship and our ability to withdraw inwardly to meet God in adoring silence. Modern Christianity is simply not producing the kind of Christian who can appreciate or experience the life in the Spirit. The words, be still and know that I am God, mean next to nothing to the self-confident, bustling worshiper in the middle of this 20th century. That's when he was writing. Situation's even worse in the beginning of the 21st century. He goes on to say, the decline of the knowledge of the holy has brought on our troubles. A rediscovery of the majesty of God will go a long way toward curing them. It is impossible to keep our moral practices sound and our inward attitudes right while our idea of God is erroneous or inadequate. If we would bring back spiritual power to our lives, we must begin to think of God more nearly as he is. Christian parents, our job is simple, to make disciples of our children. That's our mandate. 
This necessitates that we look after ourselves, that we are growing and maturing as disciples of our Lord, and assuming that to be so, in our next session, we will talk strategy. Bow with me in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the world that you are sovereign over of and the time that we live in, even though it is an evil time, and what time is not an evil time? There's a time before you flooded the earth that the Every thought and every intention of every single heart was only evil continually. And we feel like we're getting back to those days, the days of Noah. And we wonder when your return will, when the return of the Lord Jesus Christ will be. I know many of us are crying out, Maranatha, our Lord come. And so we do pray that you would send the Lord Jesus quickly. We'd love to see him glorified, adored, honored, obeyed worshiped, every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to glory of the Father. But in the meantime, as that is not the case, as your timing has not uh, sent him, we pray that you would keep us faithful to our task and that you would use the things that we learn in this next session to give us strength and encouragement in the raising of our families to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.